Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Yang Li from MIT, who will speak about the metric SYZ conjecture. Um, hello, everybody. So it's my uh, pleasure to speak at this conference. Um, it's very enjoyable so far. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the metric aspect of the SYZ conjecture, which stands for Strominger, Yao, and Zaslow. Uh, so the conjecture is about uh, club Yao metrics near a certain limit. Uh, so let me first uh, briefly remind you what Calabial metrics are. Uh, so Calabial manifolds are certain compact Kähler manifolds. Um, so the data of a Kähler manifold involves, so it's a complex manifold. So J stands for a complex structure, uh, which usually comes from algebraic geometry. So if you take some uh, equations uh, inside your ambient projective space, uh, then you take the zero locus, uh, that's the way to typically get a Kähler manifold. Uh, and uh, you also have the data of a nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form. So just to may maybe give you a very easy sense about what happens uh, in the simplest sort of model, uh, the easiest Kähler manifold is Cn uh, with the ordinary uh, complex structure and uh, you have the Kähler form, which is a 1-1 one -one type form um, like that, for instance. Uh, and this omega is, for instance, this. So this is perhaps the simplest example of what a Calabial manifold is. Now, um, you have required to satisfy uh, this partial differential equation uh, omega to the n is proportional to uh, capital omega uh, dot this. So this is usually referred to as the complex monchamp equation. So what this means is you have this two-form omega, uh, and you raise it to the nth power. So n is the complex dimension, so which means the real dimension of the manifold is 2n. Uh, so you get a volume form uh, in this way. And another way you can get a volume form is to take your holomorphic volume form omega, which involves n complex uh, coordinates, and you wedge it with its complex conjugate. So in this is another way to get a volume form, and you basically require these two things to be proportional. So that, that's the condition of a Calabial metric. Um, so the reason people are interested in such things is because from such data, you can as canonically associate a Riemannian metric which turns out to be Ricci flat. Uh, in other words, the Ricci curvature is zero. Um, notice that by construction, there is a canonical measure on the manifold, which essentially is just a volume measure. Uh, and uh, the measure is basically prescribed. Uh, the metric is usually much harder to understand compared to this measure. Uh, now, the uh, background, which is quite famous, is that uh, Yao proved a long time ago uh, the Calabi conjecture, which says that if you give me a compact Kähler manifold uh, with this nowhere vanishing holomorphic volume form, then uh, you prescribe this Kähler class, then there exists a unique Calabial metric in the same uh, Kähler class. So um, we understand the existence criteria quite well. On the other hand, what tends to be much less well understood uh, is suppose you have a sequence of Calabial metrics uh, degenerating to certain limits. Uh, and Yao's proof is uh, by a priori estimates, which doesn't tell you very much about explicit constructions. And therefore, the limiting behavior of the metric uh, is something uh, much more mysterious in general. Okay, so uh, the simplest example is this uh, thing I wrote down. The measure is just a vague measure in this case. The simplest compact example, and in some sense the only explicit compact example, is the complex tori, where you just quotient out by some lattice. Now, um, this is a, a general, um, let's say, um, general cultural fact that there is a non Euclidean complete S1 invariant Calabial metric on C2 which is known as the Taubnat metric. So the, as a general culture fact, if you are a Calabial metric on C2, uh, it does not need to be Euclidean. Um, 
Most of the examples of club Yau metrics are not explicit, as I have been hinting at. So Yau theorem is a very powerful existence theorem. It doesn't give you an explicit construction. Uh, so typical examples come from algebraic geometry. So for instance, if you take a degree m plus 2 uh, complex hypersurface inside your ambient projective space of one dimension higher, then you get an n-dimensional club Yau manifold. Okay, so algebra geometrically, it's easy to come up with examples. Metrically, it's hard to understand what's going on. Now, the other thing I want to introduce to you is special Lagrangian. So special Lagrangians are a certain class of minimal submanifolds inside uh, the Calabial ambient manifold. So it's, uh, it's a certain kind of minimal surface, uh, but quite different from what uh, most talks of uh, this conference series has been about. These are very high co-dimensional minimal surfaces. So the Calabial manifold has complex dimension n, which means real dimension 2n. Now these Lagrangian manifolds have real dimension n. So that's half of the real dimensions, typically very high co-dimensional, uh, definitely unlike hypersurfaces. So the Lagrangian condition is that uh, you have this symplectic form and you restrict to your submanifold, you require this to vanish. Such things are known as Lagrangians, uh, studied in symplectic topology. Now, special Lagrangian is to impose this additional requirement uh, that you take this holomorphic volume form, take the imaginary part, and restrict to zero. Okay, so this is an n form on your n dimensional uh, Lagrangian, uh, and you require this to vanish identically. So Lagrangian is a, a fairly flexible condition. Uh, special Lagrangian is a very rigid condition. It, it, uh, it comes in finite dimensional modular spaces, for instance. So one reason these things are interesting is because they are minimal submanifolds uh, inside the club Yau. And in fact, it's much stronger. So they are absolute uh, volume minimizers within the homology class. Um, the reason for that is calibrated geometry, uh, so it's quite easy to explain. So suppose you have any other uh, submanifold uh, in the same uh, homology class, let's call it L. It doesn't need to be Lagrangian in general. So there's a, a, just a purely linear algebraic, a linear algebraic fact that uh, pointwise on a tangent space, the real part of this holomorphic volume form is bounded by the volume element of the submanifold. So if you integrate this uh, easy leading algebraic fact, uh, you get a lower bound on the volume of the submanifold. So it's just requiring this is in the same homology class. And you get a lower bound, which is a topological thing, because uh, the real part of omega is a closed form. So this uh, only depends on the homology class. Now the main point is that if you are special Lagrangian, then you saturate this inequality. Uh, which means that if you are special Lagrangian, then anything else has to be at least that, uh, the same volume. So that proves, this is a one-line proof, that these things are absolute volume minimizers. Okay, so that's one reason people uh, care about them. The simplest example is just uh, you take the standard copy of Rn inside Cn. The simplest compact example is just you take the quotient uh, you get a copy of the torus inside C star to the n. Uh, so I emphasize these things are generally speaking quite high co-dimensional and they, um, okay, so very much unlike minimal hypersurfaces. Uh, and uh, in some sense, it's also quite different from the holomorphic subvarieties uh, in the sense that uh, the singularity structures of such things that can, can be much more complicated. Now, what is the SYZ conjecture? It stands for Strominger Yao Zaslow. So, the original paper was a physics proposal sort of paper, which uh, so it, it conveys the spirit of the conjecture. Um, so, the con conjecture roughly says that you want to consider Calabial manifolds near a certain uh, limit, uh, known as large complex structure limit. So, later you will see some examples of that. So the goal is to find a special Lagrangian torus vibration. Uh, 
So that just means, uh, so vibration is a map from, uh, from, from X to, to some base, uh, and the fibers are supposed to be Lagrange, special Lagrangian tori. Uh, and you allow for singular fibers, so saying this is a special Lagrangian torus vibration means the generic fiber is a, is, is a special, is a torus. Okay, so the large complex structure limit, so I need to say a few things about what context it arises. Um, so um, Yao's theorem tells you that in order to pin down a club Yao metric, you need two pieces of data. One is to specify the complex structure. The other is to specify the killer class. Now, in practice, uh, specifying the complex structure amounts to uh, pin down the coefficients of the defining polynomials. So for instance, if you, if you are a hypersurface inside your projective space, then what you need to do is to give me the coefficient. So that, that tells you the, the complex structure. And you can vary this choice uh, to get a one parameter family, and you are considering certain limits of that. Uh, now, what gives rise to the Kähler class uh, in practice, it often comes from a polarizing line bundle. Um, so if you like, once you have the data of some embedding into a projective space, that specifies a certain choice of Kähler class. And a uh, large complex structure limit is a way to fix essentially this choice of Kähler class and vary the complex structure by changing the coefficients of the polynomial uh, so that the equation becomes quite singular in the inner limit. So the question is really about trying to understand what happens in the limit of these metrics. So for instance, this is a very concrete example. Um, so the intuition of large complex structure limit is that the complex structure degeneration is as severe as possible. So for instance, this is a typical example of a, of a uh, large complex structure limit. So we are always talking about a family of metrics, not just one particular metric. And the questions we are asking are always about limits of, uh, of the metrics. So here uh, you have a parameter S, which we take to be very large. Um, and you have this family, which I call the Fermat uh, family for quite, uh, quite uh, clear reasons. So this should remind you of something quite famous. Um, now um, we have this, so when you vary the choice of parameter S, you get a family of complex hypersurfaces. Uh, in the limit, in the algebra geometric limit, uh, this exponentially small term, so S is very large, this is very small, uh, so this term will disappear in the algebra geometric sense. So algebra geometrically, you get uh, the product vanishes, so you get a, a union of complex projective planes. Um, on the other hand, the metric limit is very far from an algebraic variety. So, so this, I think, needs to be explained, at least to give you an example in the simplest case. So e.g., so suppose n is equal to 1, then we are talking about cubic equations uh, inside P2. Okay, so these things are quite well known. They are known as elliptic curves. So what, what do elliptic curves look like? Uh, metrically, they look like flat torus. So the Calabria metrics are flat metrics. Now, if you take the algebra geometric limit, what you get? So you get three copies of P1s inside P2. So that's just Z0, Z1, Z2 is equal to zero. So that's three copies of P1, and everybody knows what P1 looks like. It looks like a sphere, right? So this is the algebra geometric limit. Uh, and this can't possibly look like the limit of flat torus, right? So what happens is that, uh, okay, so if you're actually close to this limit, then uh, you get a smooth elliptic curve, and the elliptic curve essentially smooths out the, these kind of intersection points, and uh, the picture from the metric perspective looks more like this. So you get a torus, which is flat. They are fi it's fibered by very small circles. So you get a, a, a long circle, when, if you go along this way, and it's fibered by very, very small circles. And the metric is flat, okay? Now suppose you take the metric limit and fix the diameter, what's going to happen is that these circles shrink to points. They become extremely small. They disappear in the metric limit. 
So the metric limit is actually S1, which is very far from the algebra geometric. It's, it's definitely not going to be an algebraic variety. The dimension drops. So this phenomenon, if you take the Riemannian perspective, is known as collapsing. The dimension drops in the limit. Okay, so the, one should be careful about taking algebra geometric limit versus taking metric limit. So the general intuition about large complex structure limit is that uh, this sort of small torus fibered over some larger thing, uh, which completely uh, disregards the complex structure, that, that sort of picture is, uh, is a general intuition for this large complex structure limit. So the limit is very transcendental or not very algebraic. Okay, so the motivation for the S, uh, SYZ conjecture for differential geometries is that we like uh, Einstein manifolds and minimal Einstein manifolds, as I already explained. Now, for complex geometries, we uh, care about what sort of limits you can get out of uh, out of these very canonical metrics. Um, so there are also some other uh, motivations coming from mirror symmetry. So the the way, uh, the most heuristic, not very precise way to understand mirror symmetry is that you have a, a torus vibration over some base. Uh, so this B is a half dimensional uh, base with torus fibers and mirror symmetry, roughly speaking, is about exchanging the torus vibration with the vibration by the dual torus. Okay, so the simplest case of the SYZ conjecture, as I already explained, is the case of elliptic curves. So in this case, the conjecture becomes quite easy because elliptic curves have those flat metrics, which you can write down quite easily. So um, the thing I emphasize is that they definitely, the metric limit is very different from uh, the algebraic geometric limit. Um, now, the case of abelian varieties, which are just generalizations of elliptic curves, essentially complex torus, uh, that looks almost the same as the elliptic curve case. So anything beyond that is quite non-trivial. So the next dimension is complex dimension two. Uh, so it's known that uh, complex dimension two Calabial manifolds are either abelian varieties or something called K3 surfaces. Now, there has been some previous work about uh, description of the Calabial metric on the K3 surface. Now, what's good about complex dimension two, and in some sense very special, is that, uh, okay, if you are complex manifold, then your tangent space is a complex vector space. If you are real manifold, you, your, your tangent space is real vector space. Now, if you are complex dimension two, then your tangent space is a quaternion. And for quaternions, you get not just one complex structure, you get, you get a family of complex structures. So this is known as hypercalar situation. So uh, Calabials in complex dimension two are hypercalar. Uh, so one thing you can do is to convert special Lagrangian vibrations into holomorphic vibrations by picking the choice of a different complex structure. Now, if you do this, you, you drastically change the nature of problem because special Lagrangians are in general dimensions very hard to understand, but uh, complex subvarieties, they are, they are very easy to understand in comparison. Um, now, what Gross and Wilson did was to consider so-called elliptic vibrations, that is vibrations by complex torus or elliptic curves. Um, so the picture looks somewhat like this. So you have uh, some K3 surface, which is complex two-dimensional. Uh, so we are considering a certain limit. And in this limit, uh, the fibers uh, are very small. So the base is uh, S2, or if you like, CP1. The fibers are a complex torus, uh, generically. And there have to be uh, singular fibers for Euler characteristic reasons. So if you if you only have singular if you only have smooth fibers, the Euler characteristic would be zero. But the K3 has Euler characteristic 24. So you have to have singular fibers, and the singular fibers. Uh, so the generic case is that you only have nodal elliptic curves, like that. 
So they have, uh, so generically, there are 24 of them for Euler characteristic reasons. Okay, so uh, the fiber diameter is much smaller compared to the diameter of the base. So this is the dimension drops in the limit. So if you take the gromov hausdorff limit, keeping the di diameter fixed, then you, will get, get, you would get a two-dimensional limit, which is a singular scalar metric on this, on this space S2. Um, now, if, you, uh, if you're in a generic region, which is to say stay away from these singular fibers, uh, then the metric is so-called semi-flat. So the feature is that you have these torus vibrations and the metric is almost uh, up to exponentially small corrections uh, symmetric under the T2 action. Uh, so uh, such things are called semi-flat, which means that the restriction to the T2 uh, uh, essentially flat up to exponentially small errors. Now, this, this sort of description happens in uh, most of the measure of, of the K3 surface. Um, on the other hand, that does not cover everything. So there are still these neighborhoods of, uh, of the singular fibers, which have a rather different description. So if you sort of uh, just look at the local model of what happens around these regions, so these regions are very small from, from the from the volume perspective, uh, but but they have they are essentially the regions where the L two curvature is concentrated. So almost all the L two concentrated uh, curvature happens here. So in in this generic region, what happens is collapsing with bounded remaining curvature. So almost all the curvature go there. So this region has a model metric known as the Ugurivatha metric. Uh, it's an explicit metric constructed from uh, the gibbons hawking ansatz. So if you are familiar with Riemannian geometry, you may know about that. And this itself is already quite a complicated model, uh, and it describes the neighborhood of the singular fiber. Now, inside the neighborhood of the singular fiber, there's a smaller region, which is the neighborhood of the singular point, or critical point of this vibration. And if you, if you uh, zoom in this region, you get something embedded in a Ugurivafa metric, and this is the top knot metric, uh, which is a complete Calabia metric on, on, C, on C2. The Ugurivafa metric is incomplete. This one is complete. It's, it happens in, at an extremely small length scale. So this is the description of what happens in complex dimension two. It's already quite non-trivial. And as you, as you can already see, uh, the behavior is quite different for the generic region versus the special region. So later I will try to present to you uh, two different flavors of results. So some concern the special region, some concern the generic region. Now let's move up the dimension to at least three. Now, you don't have this quaternion uh, available to you. So then the question becomes really hard. So one of the reasons uh, this uh, problem has stagnated for some 20 years is that special Lagrangian vibrations are generally speaking very different from holomorphic vibrations. So for, if you have holomorphic vibration, then what happens is that you can have singular fibers but the vibration map is a holomorphic map, which in particular from the real perspective is a C-infinity map. That's not true for special Lagrangians. That's very false for special Lagrangians. So generally speaking, a special Lagrangian vibration map uh, needs not to, to be a C-infinity map. I mean, it, it can have rather bad singularities. Um, so Joyce observed this, and that basically stopped progress on this problem for some 20 years. Now, let me try to uh, give you a list of results. So as I hinted, uh, there are results concerning the generic region, and there are results concerning the special regions. Um, so in some sense, the generic region is most of the measure. Um, the special region is almost in the, the con like just the concentration region of the curvature. 
Okay, so the first result is uh, concerns this very special family, uh, which I call the Fermat family for, for obvious reasons. Um, so the result is that the special Lagrangian vibration exists in the generic region for, uh, for very large S. So what this more precisely means is that uh, when S is very large, then you can find a large open subset inside this manifold. Uh, and the measure of this open subset goes to 100% in the limit, uh, such that you can find a special Lagrangian vibration on this open subset. So the special Lagrangian vibration for each choice of S uh, is not global, or at least I did not construct a global vibration, but the percentage of this, this region goes to 100% in a limit. Okay, so this is what I mean by generic region. So 99% of the manifold in a measure theoretic sense. So this is result number one, which I hope is easier to understand. Now re result number two is much more general, but it depends on conjecture. Uh, so for uh, a quite large class of, well, essentially the full generality, uh, conditional on a certain conjecture in Archimedean geometry, you can prove this generic region version of the SYZ conjecture in essentially full generality. Now, um, so since things conjectural are probably not that convincing, so um, I should uh, mention a few results towards the verification of this conjecture. So the Fermat hypersurface case, which I showed you in the previous slide, was reproved by uh, two groups of people independently. So this is uh, Pile Schneider and independently by Hood Graham and his collaborators. Uh, and more recently, um, I had a, a very recent new paper verifying the non-Comedian conjecture for a quite large class of Calabial hypersurfaces inside toric funnel manifolds, uh, which involves solving a certain variational problem um, and uh, essentially try to solve a, a global version of the real motion pair equation with singular affine structures, if you like. So, um, for instance, just to give you a sense of, uh, of the generality of this at the current moment, uh, in complex dimension three, um, there are maybe several hundred families of uh, examples of this type at the moment. Uh, so the, the criteria works in, in general dimensions. So let's talk about uh, the non-generic region, which is the analog of this part. Uh, so that has a very different flavor. Uh, so the results are, like, let, let me give you a summary. So there is a generalized gibbons hawking ansatz. So remember that this uh, two-dimensional version, the ugri wafa metric, was constructed uh, using, the, uh, use, using the usual version of the gibbons hawking and there is a higher dimensional generalization, which is nonlinear. Um, and uh, so basically, you can construct the analog of the Ugurivafa metric on the local models or expected local models of the um, non generic region. So uh, maybe let me explain a little bit about why it's called positive and negative vertices by, by telling you what the algebra uh, geometric community thinks about thinks what should happen. So this is very far from being proven, but what, ha what, what people expect is that you have a Calabial threefold X, so it maps into uh, some base. So this base is topologically S3, uh, not the wrong, definitely not the wrong metric. And inside this S3, it's expected that there is some kind of co-dimension two locus, which people expect that up to generic specificity assumptions looks like a trivalent graph. So trivalent means each vertex emits three edges. Now, uh, so it's expected that the singular happen, uh, fibers happen around these trivalent vertices. It's expected that the discriminant locus is a, is a thickening 
a very small thickening uh, where the amount of thickening goes to zero in the limit. So this is supposed, this is supposed to be a SYZ vibration globally. That's the most optimistic expectation. And the discriminant locus looks like this. Now what happens metrically around the edge region should be transversely modeled on what already happens in complex dimension two. Now, it leaves open the question about what should happen, you know, a, a, around the vertices. And there are two types of vertices, depending on the complex geometric local model of the vertices. And that, that's the two things happening there. And they are called positive and negative because they are all their characteristics are plus or minus one. Okay, so basically the upshot is that uh, the, the, the two-dimensional thing has a candidate model, which is supposed to, to, to generalize this thing, um, and, uh, and it's supposed to give you the local model of, uh, of, of the non-generic region. So what has been done is that the models have been constructed. What has not been done is that these things really model the compact Calabi-R threefold matrix. OK, so the flavors of these two types of results rely on very different uh, tools. So for the generic region result, which is about you know, the existence of special Lagrangian vibrations on 99% of the manifold, uh, so the sort of tools, uh, the toolbox is roughly on this page. So it involves some complex geometry, uh, involves a little bit of birational geometry, uh, dual complex in essential skeletons. Um, so there's a dimensional reduction called semi-flat metric. So this part has been understood for some at least 20 years. That's quite an easy part. Now there is a uh, quite difficult result by Ovidio Savin about elliptic PDEs, uh, which I'm going to mention a bit later. It relies on the regularity theory of the real Monchampe equation. Uh, it relies on the study of uh, plurisubharmonic functions in uh, general dimensions. So if you like, complex pluripotential theory is like the generalization of uh, subharmonic functions, but adapted to the complex setting. Um, and uh, for the part involving non-comedian geometry, there's a package developed by Sebastian Buxon, etc. So that's the sort of toolbox for, for, for the generic re region results. Now, for the non-generic region results, they have a very different flavor, and they involve completely different tools. So the easy part of this, uh, well, easy in the sense that uh, it doesn't involve very serious analysis, is um, you can write down the generalization of the gibbons hawking ansatz, and then uh, you need to use a uh, package developed by Tian and Yao to find new Calabia metrics in non-compact settings. And there are lots of uh, gluing style constructions and uh, some, uh, well, you need to handle rather complicated integrals and series, rather like the Weierstrass uh, series sort of thing. So, little joke for you. Um, okay, so. Uh, let me give you a, a rough sense of what uh, is commonly believed. So in a Calabi-R threefold case, let's say it's strict Calabi-R threefolds, it's believed that this gromov hausdorff limit is homeomorphic to S3. That's the con a conjecture of uh, Kansevich and Soberman. So re really the, the sort of all, all the kind of highest expectations uh, are shown in this picture. Uh, which is very far from being proven, and uh, it doesn't really have that much of an evidence. Um, so whether or not there exists a global SYZ vibration, that's anybody's bet. Um, well, this trivalent graph, uh, it's a, a sort of useful mythology. Um, now, what we do not know uh, in the generic region, we don't have a proof of the non-comedian conjecture in full generality. 
Oops, so the, recent, the most recent progress verifies this for, for a, a respectful amount of uh, examples, but, but that's still very far from proving this in general. Um, so we don't have control on the singular set of the gromov hausdorff limit to say almost anything about its topology. So for instance, we don't know that a singular set is called dimension two. The, uh, the, the expectation is it's a trivalent graph. But, but even the core dimension two claim seems very far off. Um, so whether or not these positive or negative vertices actually are metric local models for realistic uh, compact Calabi-Yau degenerations, that seems to be a very hard question. Uh, the singularities of the special Lagrangians uh, are extremely difficult to understand, and so far even inside the Euclidean C3, that's still a very much an open problem. So the rest of today, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the uh, much more explicit uh, FEMA family, which is the first paper in this series. So the, uh, the result is that for this explicit family, the special Lagrangian vibration exists on almost the full measure uh, in the sense that you know the larger you take the parameters the larger the subset so in the limit you get 100 percent of the measure on which the special Lagrangian exists mm -hmm. okay so let me first tell you the uh, easy parts of this story which is the complex geometric part um, so the intuition is that near the large complex structure limit, complex geometrically, the generic region, that is most of the measure, is locally modeled on C star to the n. And C star has uh, a circle direction. So C star to the n has n circle directions, which is, you know, where the torus comes from. Of course, this, the difficult part has to do with understanding the metric. So to understand the complex structure is a relatively easy thing. Now, uh, so we are working about, uh, on this Fermat family, which is a hypersurface. So you have this polynomial you need, which, which vanishes. Now, this polynomial involves lots of monomial terms, like zi to the n plus 2. Now, uh, there are in general quite a lot of terms. But in the generic region, uh, only two monomials would dominate all the rest. Okay, so generally speaking, you have you have all these monomials, um, but but these monomials are, are, are accompanied with certain coefficients, and the coefficients are you know you take it to certain limits, and in the limit, not all the monomials are equally important. So in the generic region, what happens is that you just have two monomials dominating all the rest. So you can't just have one monomial because the sum is zero. So you at least have to have two, uh, and all the others you can basically ignore up to exponentially small errors. So if you do that, just taking two monomials inside C star to the n plus one being equal, uh, what you get is a copy of C star to the n. Okay, so just imagine C star to the n plus one uh, being this big toric open subset inside your ambient projected space PM plus one. Um, so you restrict your hypersurface to this region, you set two monomials to be equal, what you get is a copy of C star to the n. So this is why you get C star to the n, and uh, the volume form is also up to exponentially small errors. This is very standard description. So logarithms appear very often in this story because the torus essentially comes from the fibers of logarithm maps. Now the other uh, simple differential geometric fact to explain is that Calabi metrics have a dimensional reduction. So if you take a uh, function on C star to the n, uh, and require the function to be invariant under the action of Tn. So Tn is the, the, the torus uh, which kind of acts on C, uh, C, N, uh, C star to the n. 
So if you require the function to be invariant, then uh, the function comes from, from Rn. So you have this logarithm map. The logarithm is just taking the log of uh, the modulus for, for each coordinate. The fibers are just these Tns, and these, these Tns are related to the special Lagrangian torus. Okay, so uh, if you do this, um, you reduce your phi to a function downstairs on Rn, which I call u. And phi is a Kähler potential if and only if the thing downstairs is a convex function. And phi satisfies the Calabial condition if and only if the thing downstairs satisfies the real Mont-Jampe equation, which is the determinant of the real Hessian is constant. It's this quite a familiar equation from the elliptic PD community. Now, uh, the metrics arising from this dimensional reduction are known as semi-flat metrics. The reason is because such metrics would always be torus symmetric by, by construction. So if you have a Riemannian metric, which is symmetric under the torus, and then, then you restrict it to the torus, it would still be symmetric. So it would have to be a flat metric on the torus. So being flat on each of the torus is, is what's meant by semi-flat. Now there are some, uh, so if you really try to be careful, you need to keep track of where the parameter comes in. So there is some kind of semi-flat uh, description which uh, you can imagine. Now the main point of talking about semi-flat metrics is that um, this logarithm map, which is just taking the logarithm of each of the modulus of these holomorphic functions, uh, in this model case, so if your metric is actually semi-flat, then um, this logarithm map is actually a special Lagrangian torus vibration. So all these tori, which come from the fiber of these maps, are special Lagrangian. So this is an easy computation. So therefore, the nature of the SYZ conjecture is really about whether or not your Calabria metric in the generic region is close to being semi-flat in a very strong sense. So if you know that your actual Calabria metric is up to C infinity small errors modeled on some choice of semi-flat metric, so semi-flat metrics correspond to solutions of real motion per equation. So if you can find some semi-flat metric, which is uh, an approximate description of the true Calabria metric, then since you have an explicit family of special Lagrangians with, re with respect to this, uh, then by small perturbation, you get a special Lagrangian vibration here. So the real difficulty is to prove that the metric has this asymptotic description. So there are really two parts you need to, pr you need to prove. One is to produce a semi-flat metric. So a priori, you just get an abstract Calabria metric uh, so why should it be torus symmetric? Well, you need to produce some semi-flat metric, or in other words, you need to produce a solution of the real Mont-Jean equation. Uh, and second, you need to prove that, uh, that these two things are indeed uh, approximately equal. Okay, so the first uh, major reduction is to reduce a C-infinity estimate problem to a C0 estimate problem. And the main thing that this uses are essentially two things. Uh, one is uh, the theory of the regularity theory of real Mont-Jean equation. The other is uh, a theorem of Ovidio Sabin that I'm going to mention. So the C0 estimate statement is the following. So you want to find some solution of the real Mont-Jean equation such that the Calabria metric uh, is essentially close to this Bilman Champagne solution uh, in a C0 sense instead of just a, in, instead of C infinity sense. So C0 is much, much weaker a priori compared to C infinity. So if you're C infinity, then you're done. Now, 
the reason you can do this reduction, it involves two things. One is by the regularity theory of Wilmer Champagne equations, you might as well pretend. So once you have this statement, so we want to improve it into C infinity. Now, the regularity theory uh, allows you to pretend as if this thing is C infinity already, but you still need to show that this closeness can be improved from C0 to C infinity. And that uses a difficult result of Ovidio Sabin. So Sabin's result is a, a result purely about PDEs. Uh, so it applies to actually a very large range of second order elliptic PDEs, uh, including the complex Monchampe equation, which is the one we care about here. And the theorem uh, roughly says this. So if you have a given smooth solution of some elliptic equation with some structural conditions, and if you have a, a nearby solution in a C0 sense, then you can bootstrap to C infinity. Now, this theorem is difficult for the reason that usually in elliptic PDE theory, uh, once, you need, once you get to C2 control, then you are in good shape. But a priori, the assumption is only on C0. So, so that actually requires significant work, and, and that work has been done by Sabin. So basically, Sabin's result can be applied to uh, our setting uh, after taking some local universal covers, and that, that accomplishes this reduction from C infinity to C0. Now, so the main difficulty now is to prove the C0 potential estimate. So I just recall to you that it's, it's this statement we are looking at here. So you, you need to do two things. One is to produce the solution U of the real motion pair equation. Second, you need to prove that the Calabial potential is close to U. So you need to do these two things. There are more than one approaches to, to do this. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you one of them. So the solution to the real Monchampe equation in this approach is produced by extracting a subsequential limit of the local Calabial potential. So argue a priori that the limit satisfies the real Monchampe equation. So your goal is that the Calabial potential is close to, to the solution of the real Monchampe equation. Uh, and this is an a priori estimates approach. So the intuition of this thing uh, is that if you look at a sufficiently long cylindrical region in C star to the n, uh, then bounded Kähler potentials look very similar to convex functions. Now, how should you understand this? So I already told you one relation between uh, Kähler potentials and convex functions. Namely, if you are torus invariant Kähler potential, then uh, you, the function can be uh, descended to downstairs. That's a convex function. Now, uh, the deeper question is, suppose you just give me an arbitrary potential upstairs. How are you going to produce any convex function downstairs? And the answer is, uh, you can do Fourier analysis. So you have this uh, uh, Tn in this vibration, and you can uh, Fourier expand the function in, in this Tn fiber direction. And you can take the zeros order coefficient, right? So for each fiber, you get a number, which is just the average of, of the function on this on this torus. And for each point of this, you can you can get a, a, a number. So you get a function on R n, and that function is automatically convex if you start with a pluralistic harmonic function. Okay. So in a generic region, you can produce these local convex functions. So, so far, we, we, we have nothing about the real Monchampe equation yet. So it's just a collection of convex functions. And a rather subtle step is to patch together these local convex functions into a, a global Kähler potential. So in some sense, um, this second kind of auxiliary potential uh, is essentially built out of patching convex functions. 
So it has uh, essentially the same sort of regularity property of convex functions, which is better than for general Kähler potentials. Uh, and this patching steps involves uh, the controlling the combinatorics of Fermat hypersurfaces. And it quite crucially uses the discrete symmetry of the Fermat hypersurfaces. So the Fermat hypersurfaces is symmetric when you permute all the variables. It has a large discrete symmetry, which is useful in this combinatorial step. Now, um, the intuition I said about the Kähler potentials being rather similar to convex functions, the, the more precise statement is the following uh, estimates. So uh, you get the original Kähler potential of the Calabial metric, and you get this uh, new potential, which essentially comes from the convex function coming from averaging procedure. <coughs> Uh, and without even invoking the Calabial metric condition, uh, just using some kind of boundedness of the potential, uh, you can automatically get an upper bound and an integral lower bound. So remember, S is a very large parameter. So this means this is almost zero, it's like an almost rigidity statement. Now the lower bound is more interesting. So what, what, what does this really mean? So it's the integral of some exponentially uh, of some exponential quantity. Now what you what you would like to have is that this thing has a has a lower bound. Now so what you, you don't want is this thing becomes very negative. Now here there's another minus sign. So what you don't want is that the exponent becomes very positive. And what this statement is saying is that this might become very positive, but only on an exponentially small subset. And uh, the point is that we have also inserted this, this square root of s, which is a very large number. So the, basically the intuition of the second statement is that this is lower bounded uh, by a very small number except on an exponentially small subset. So, so far we haven't even used the Calabial condition, um, the metric condition. Now, here is where the pluripotential theory comes in. Uh, so pluripotential theory uh, developed by uh, Kolo G and many others is about, so is useful here for kind of improving the statement to, to, to remove this exponentially small subset. So instead of, so basically complex pluripotential theory can be used to compare two Kähler potentials. And the fact that you really work with Kähler potentials is quite important. Uh, so if you, uh, okay, so if you do this, you get a C0 estimate. So, so far we haven't used, uh, we haven't said anything about the equation satisfied by Psi. It's just that you, your Calabial potential is close to something built out of convex function. Now, for convex functions, uh, it's automatically Lipschitz once you know it's bounded. So essentially, Lipschitz regularity comes from for free for, for Psi. Um, and uh, um, the, the intuition is that the Kähler potential is close, C0 close to some convex function. Now, once you have the uniform Lipschitz property, then uh, you can get a subsequential limit. And now you pass the equation satisfied by the Calabial potential to the limit. Um, what you get is that the, this limiting function satisfies the real motion pair equation. Now, the intuition of this step, if you're slightly familiar with the usual theory of Calabial metrics, is that if you have a sequence of uh, plurisubharmonic functions converging in some C0 sense, and you consider the associated complex motion and pay measure, then, then the measure converges weakly. Now, here in our setting, you, it's slightly more complicated because the manifolds are also changing, 
But once you pass to the correct local universal co cover coordinates, then, 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 then it, it works essentially in the same way. So for, um, for this uh, program, basically the difficult part is to produce the convex function globally uh, and to uh, develop the um, ecology uh, sort of pluripotential theory package in uh, very degenerate complex structure settings. So uh, just to give you a summary about what we have achieved, so we proved uh, that uh, there is this limiting solution which, is, uh, which satisfies the real motion pay equation and essentially by construction you get C0 closeness of this thing to the actual club potential for large enough S. Um, so that is basically feeding into the, um, the C0 uh, closeness statement and Savin's result improves C0 to C infinity. And what you get is that the semi-flat metric is the approximate, well, in C infinity strong sense, approximating the actual Clabial metric. And once you get to this stage, the existence of the special Lagrangian uh, vibration just comes from rather easy perturbation theory, which has been known for quite a long time. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I want to tell you. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. Are there any questions for Yang? Any questions in the back there? Sure. So when you say for large compact limit, the, the generic region is almost 100%, but yeah. why it's not true for small s where you can do the deformation? Small s? I mean, Sorry, no. when, when you, you can, once you have one special Lagrange vibration, you can do deformation to move it to everywhere. Is that true? Uh, well, okay. So the unobstructedness of special Lagrangian is only, only known if you are smooth. So if, if, if you change the complex structure, well, so, okay, so you can deform as long as you stay smooth, but, but you have no control of uh, when the singularity develops. But singularity set will be measure zero, right? Is that true? Not, not, That's not, so, not even so, so special Lagrangian vibrations could have, uh, okay, so, all right. So, so if you de deform a sequence of a smooth special Lagrangian, there's no guarantee that you get anything in, in the limit is still smooth, I think. Mm -hmm. That's okay. okay. So at some stage, the singular set might become larger and larger, and you, then you eventually becomes, I mean, there, there will be no smooth Lagrangian, special Lagrangian anyway. Uh, okay. A priori could happen. I mean, okay. I'm not saying that uh, you, what you like would not necessarily, it's forbidden. But. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions for Yang? All right, so let me just ask a quick question. Do you think it's possible to prove the SYZ for another class of examples? For, for what? Another class of examples. Uh, yes, it is. so so far I, I, I mentioned that uh, there is a non-comedian approach and my most recent paper has verified this conjecture for uh, several, let's say. So there's a criterion about, about toric funnel hy uh, hypersurfaces um, which uh, which works in general dimensions and in complex dimension three, it has been verified by uh, Hood, Graham, etc. in an upcoming paper uh, for several hundred examples. Oh, excellent. So last call for questions. Okay, well, let's thank Yang again for an excellent talk.